<laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, thank you, Jason. Thank you. We're all looking forward to hear what <laughs> President Kennedy has to say. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for coming. So what we're talking about today is something I don't think has really been discussed, which is insulin toxicity. And I think we never really think about it for the reasons uh, doc, uh, the, the, in this um, slide. Basically, I think that we've been uh, kind of thinking about diabetes in a certain way, and because of that, we kind of miss the truth. So the greatest enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Too often, we hold fast to the cliches of our forebears. We subject all facts to a pre- prefabricated set of interpretations, and we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. So with that, let's so think you about... Have you have some speech writer. <laughs> 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 I wonder why Gordon hasn't written that for me in one of my letters. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, let's think about type 2 diabetes. Um, this is the way we think about type 2 diabetes. So, we always say it's a chronic disease, it's a progressive disease. So while you can actually um, uh, treat it for a short period of time, after, after a while, after a period of two to three years, it progresses. And that's just the way we think about diabetes. And we say that because type 2 diabetes, they say, has multiple pathophysiologic abnormalities. That is, there's all these different uh, mechanisms and they all contribute to the hyperglycemia. And that's the reason it tends to progress over time. But what if we got it wrong? What if it's not actually a progressive disease? And what if it's actually a curable disease? That would really change our whole practice because if we can think about the pathophysiology and we can really understand it, then maybe we can think about rational treatments for diabetes and maybe we can cure it. So let's get started. You have to go back a little bit first and think about type 2 diabetes because really the core of type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. So I've depicted here what insulin resistance is and basically it is the cell is resistant to the effect of the insulin and because of that you can see that you, you get very very high levels of insulin. And the question always is what causes insulin resistance? And some people say it's obesity, but then it's hard to, to show any kind of um, uh, mechanism. So let's back up a little bit further and say, how do you develop resistance in a biological system? Well, if you think about antibiotic uh, resistance, it's very clear that the causative agent is the antibiotic itself. If you think about viruses, for instance, such as a vaccine, a vaccine is basically a killed virus. Viruses cause viral resistance. If you think about drugs, you can take any kind of drug, but particularly the addictive drugs. You can see that uh, at first they produce a very high effect, but over time the effect tends to diminish. In essence, the body has developed a resistance to this drug. And many, many drugs show this very same uh, phenomenon, nicotine, nitroglycerin, uh, alcohol, benzodiazepines. So many, many drugs show this uh, type of pattern. So in fact, the drugs themselves can cause drug resistance. And we know the mechanism in the case of drugs and in case of hormones, for instance. Um, if you uh, expose a uh, body to a constant high level, what you develop is downregulation of the receptors. And you actually take advantage of this in the case of ADD. So you have these hyperactive kids, and what you give them is Ritalin, which is not a sedative, it's a stimulant. So you'd think at first, wow, that's really crazy. Why would you give a stimulant to a too stimulated kid? Well, the reason is because of this phenomenon of downregulation of receptors. So as you develop the resistance, the body develops a resistance to the stimulants. Therefore, you get not increased activity with the stimulation, uh, with the Ritalin, you actually get decreased activity. So this is a very well-known phenomenon. So it's these high persistent levels which are really key to causing the downregulation of the receptors and the resistance. And you can see that these all show a uh, reinforcing cycles of resistance. That is, as you have an exposure, a persistent exposure, it gives you resistance. And the resistance leads to higher exposure. What does that mean? If you're to take the example of antibiotics, if you use antibiotics, you develop resistance. The resistance causes you to use more antibiotics. 
and that causes more resistance. So you can see these are vicious cycles, so they keep going round and around. So if we think about it that way, let's think about the question now, what causes insulin resistance? So the first thing to ask is, does insulin itself cause insulin resistance? Yeah, George? Sorry to interrupt, but you know, antibiotic <coughs> resistance would be different from other drug mechanisms, right? I mean, you know, sure. the Ritalin is, uh, you know, you, you may be the receptor, but you know, the antibiotic resistance is quite different. You know, plasmids and sure. transmitting. That, so I don't know whether one can, you know, put this, everything into the same cycle. No, I'm, not, I'm just trying to use it as, as an example. I'm not saying that it's the same as antibiotic resistance. I'm saying that the first place we should really be looking for resistance is the agent itself. I'm not saying that that proves the antibiotics is quite different. For hormonal systems, it has more similarity. But let's move on and look at insulin because that's really what we're interested in, not antibiotics, right? So if you look at insulin resistance, you can take the example of insulinomas. For instance, these are rare tumors that produce too much insulin. And if you look at the insulin resistance, you can see that the higher your level of insulin, the more insulin you develop. And that really makes a lot of sense because if you have an insulinoma and you don't develop resistance, your sugars are going to be less than one and you'll die. So the body produces resistance to protect itself. And that's a normal thing. And you can actually show that if you resect these adenomas, you actually restore the insulin resistance. So in this case, you can see that the insulin has actually caused the insulin resistance. And you can actually do this experimentally in, um, in men. What they did here was that they took a group of men and they just infused them with insulin. And these are not diabetics. These are just normal, healthy men in a metabolic lab. And what they did is they used a euglycemic clamp, which means that they kept the glucose the same but they infused higher and higher doses of insulin. And then they measured what happened. So what happens is that when you measure them after a certain period of time, they can't use the glucose as well. So those ones that got a lot of insulin couldn't use the glucose as well. In essence, you've produced insulin resistance. And you can do the same thing in, with physiological levels of insulin. That is, this is the same sort of experiment, but they use much lower levels of insulin. So they use physiologic levels. So as opposed to the previous study where they use very high levels, these are levels that you would normally see in your body. And when you infuse them, you can see that the insulin sensitivity significantly decreases. In other words, if you give chronic physiologic hyperinsulinemia, you actually get insulin resistance. So you can produce this in anybody. I could do this in you. If you give high persistent levels of insulin, you will get insulin resistance. So this is a causal relationship because you've actually caused it by giving the agent. And this is what we do in type 2 diabetics. So this is a study from 1993. And what they did was they took diabetics. And at the time, the focus was on glucose and controlling the glucose. So what they did at time zero was that they uh, took these diabetics and said, we're going to control your uh, sugars really, really well, really well. We're going to give you lots of insulin. So uh, by six months, they're on 100 units a day of insulin. Their sugars were really good. Uh, the problem was that you can see that there's a very clear relationship between the total insulin dose and the resistance. So this is the glucose disposal rate, so how well your body is using the insulin. And what you see is that the higher the dose of insulin, the more the insulin resistance. Since insulin resistance is really the heart of diabetes, what you've got is the insulin making the sugars better, but making the diabetes worse. Even worse, of course, there was a huge weight gain because they're, they're getting all this insulin. So 8.7 kilos, which is roughly 20 pounds. And what the other really, really interesting part about the study was that they looked at the caloric intake and what you can see is that time zero, they had 2,000 uh, calories, and by six months, they're only taking 1,700 calories a day. So even as they were getting fatter, they were eating less and less. And why is that? That's because the influence of insulin. Um, but as you can see, the main point is that you're developing increasing resistance. In other words, the insulin is making the diabetes worse.
And if you look at this from David Ludwig, he's a pediatric endocrinologist from Harvard, you can see that the insulin resistance certainly causes the hyperinsulinemia. But the other thing you have to recognize is that the hyperinsulinemia drives the resistance as well. But which one came first? That's the real question, right? It's kind of like the chicken and the egg. Well, you could luckily we've studied this in juvenile obesity. And what you can see is that really the first thing that you see is high insulin levels. So if you take uh, people with obesity, and these are children, and you split them into three groups. You can split them into a group that, has, that is not obese. You take a group that has obesity but of short duration, so less than 4.5 years. And you take one that is more than 4.5 years, and you study their insulin uh, mechanics. And what you see is that all the obese uh, patients actually show a spike in their glucose and a spike in their insulin. So it doesn't matter how long you've had the obesity and that contrasts with the non-obese where they don't actually have this high spike of insulin. The insulin of course is the, uh, one of the major players in the obesity. If you look at insulin resistance though, you see a different picture. That is, as you have an increasing duration of the obesity, you have higher levels of plasma <coughs> insulin, fasting plasma insulin, and higher levels of resistance. So the resistance is not there to begin with. The resistance is normal to begin with. But under the influence of this hyperinsulinemia, you develop insulin resistance. The insulin resistance translates into a fasting plasma insulin that goes high. So the time sequence of juvenile obesity, which goes along with diabetes, is that the insulin seems to be the primary insult. And from the high insulin levels, then you get the insulin resistance. And you might think, well, if that's the case, why don't we get resistance all the time? Because insulin is, you know, there all the time. But the, the, the truth of the matter is that if you release the hormones in a pulsatile manner, you prevent the development of resistance. So if you look at almost any hormone in the body, it's not a steady state. So insulin is released in a pulsatile circadian rhythm. And it's the same with cortisol, certainly the case with PTH, and virtually every hormone in the body. And by releasing it in a pulsatile manner, you actually can prevent the development of this resistance. This is the way we give insulin. Certainly not pulsatile, but very, very steady state, which is going to lead to more resistance. And you actually know this because you can take advantage of this in therapeutics again. So if you look at your nitroglycerin patch, you put it on for 12 hours and you take it off for 12 hours, right? Why don't you leave it on 24 hours a day? Well, it stops working. Why? Because you're developing resistance. When you take it off, that's when you can prevent the development of this resistance. So this is what we know so far. So insulin causes insulin resistance. It's not the only cause, but it, it can cause insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is going to lead back to high insulin levels. And what you need is really high persistent levels. That's what really drives the resistance. In other words, insulin causes diabetes. So let's, let's, with that background, let's think about the complications of diabetes. And this is the way we think about the complications of diabetes. Now there's a lot of complications of diabetes. It affects virtually every organ system in the body. And we think of type 1 and type 2 diabetes as the same. Okay, so type 1 and type 2 diabetes leads to high blood sugars. And through various uh, mechanisms such as advanced glycation end products, oxidative stress, and other things, it leads to the complication. So our current treatment paradigm says, well, if we can get rid of those high blood sugars, then we can get rid of the complications. And that's the way that we treat diabetes as it stands today. The problem with this uh, treatment paradigm is that it's not true. It's not true in any way. If you look at the ACCORD study, so this was published in 2008, what you see is that you can randomize two groups. In one group, the intensive therapy is going to get much less uh, sugars, much better controlled sugars. So according to that, that, that paradigm, you should do much better. The problem is you don't. You actually do worse. So there's an increased risk of death. And you can do this with almost every study because it wasn't that simply that one study. All the studies showed the same thing. So the advanced study, if you have intensive control, there was simply no benefit. 
The VADT, which was published shortly thereafter, showed the same uh, thing. And most recently, the ORIGIN trial, which took patients with impaired glucose tolerance, gave them insulin or not, there was no benefit. So it turns out that there, this, this treatment paradigm is completely not true. And what we always forget is this. There's a difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is the lack of insulin. So most of your toxicity is mediated through the high glucose. But in type 2 diabetes, you have high insulin levels. So is it possible that in type 2 diabetes, as opposed to type 1 diabetes, the toxicity is actually mediated through both the high blood sugars as well as the increased insulin. Now if you think about insulin and atherosclerosis, there's a lot of reasons why you might think that might be true and I've listed some of them here and we'll go through those. But can we look back and see if, the, see if insulin actually is a toxic treatment? Well it turns out you can easily find that. So if you look at this study from 2010, they took all the patients in Saskatchewan so 12,000 odd new diabetics. And they looked at what they were on. And they said, well, if you're on insulin, you have a much higher risk of death. That is compared to no exposure, a high, uh, high uh, exposure to insulin more than doubles your risk of death. And this is the same thing that was found. This was 2013 published by Curie. Um, and he looked at not just insulin, but he looked at insulin, uh, metformin, sulfonylureas, as well as insulin. So sulfonylureas as a class raise insulin levels. Not as bad as insulin, but they still do. And you can see clearly that when you compare to metformin, the sulfonylureas have about a 43% increased risk of cardiovascular events. And the worst one is the metformin, which has about an 80%. So it's certainly consistent with the hypothesis that the insulin itself is a toxic agent. And if you look at populations, you can see, for instance, in native populations, so this was the Catavans off of New Guinea here, and what you can see is that their insulin levels are very, very low. And this is a Swedish uh, reference range, so a 10%. Uh, you can see that the average um, native, this Catavan, has the average is lower than the 10% the, the of the Swedish. So if they have very, very low insulin levels, and they really have non-existent cardiovascular disease. If you look at regular uh, European populations, so this was published in 2004, Diabellina Logica, you can see there's a relationship between serum insulin as, uh, and mortality. But the problem is these studies don't actually answer the question, because is it really the insulin or is insulin simply the marker of insulin resistance? So for that, we actually have to look, step back a little bit. So if we step back to the basic science, we can think about atherosclerosis because that really is what mediates most of the toxicity. So hyperinsulinemia actually makes worse at every stage all the steps of uh, atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis, of course, is not simply cholesterol plugging up the artery but it's actually considered to be a response to injury. So there's many different steps. And every single step along the way is helped by insulin. So you have increased adhesion molecules on the endothelial cell. You have increased trend endothelial migration of these leukocytes so the white blood cells can get into the vessel wall. It stimulates the smooth muscle proliferation and it has inflammatory effects which is really at the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis and insulin makes all of these worse. These are the references if you want to look them up. If you actually biopsy these human atherosclerotic plaques, you can actually stain them for insulin. And what you find is that there's insulin receptors at all the small vessels, not the big vessels, either LV is the large vessel, but at all the small vessels in this human plaque, there's insulin receptors. So what you can do is you can bathe these human plaques in insulin and you can see what happens. And what happens is that they grow blood vessels because they have insulin receptors there. So they grow blood vessels. So what you can find is that you get much more atherosclerosis in the presence of insulin. The other thing you know about insulin is that it causes salt and water uh, retention. 
That is, uh, Dr. Parving showed all the way back in 1989 that if you give insulin, you will retain salt and water mostly at the level of the proximal tubule, which is not a good thing because you're going to get hypertension and edema and all sorts of things. So on that level, you also might think that insulin might be actually a very, very bad agent for people. So really, if we're thinking about insulin toxicity, there actually is a lot of good reasons that you might think that insulin treatment is, is, is very toxic. And this is where it really, really starts to get interesting, is that after the failure of the VADT and the ADVANCE and the ACCORD trials, people started to look at different agents and see if there's a difference between them. And what they found was very interesting. So if you take 28,000 patients from the UK General Practice database, so all these patients were on one agent and you intensify them to two agents. As your hemoglobin A1C goes up, your mortality goes up. So that's okay, that we can understand. That's glucotoxicity, toxicity from high glucose. But what you don't expect is that there is actually a very an increase in the mortality as your hemoglobin A1C goes down. And it's especially marked when you look at insulin. That is to say, if you're on insulin and your A1C is 6%, it's as bad for you as if your A1C is 10.5%. That's crazy. That should not happen. Because we think of all the toxicity as glucotoxicity. And this was confirmed in another study uh, from Diabetes Care. And what they said is that if you look at the 6 to 8% range, as you go up, your mortality goes up. So that's fine, you get about a 20% increase in mortality, but as you go down below 6%, your mortality also goes up. And, the real, and if you look at insulin, there's a huge increase. And the problem is that this shouldn't happen. Because if you look at non-diabetics, as you go down from your A1C, your mortality goes down. Because your glucose is better, so therefore you have less mortality. And you can't actually understand why this actually occurs until you realize that the treatment itself is, to is toxic. That is, at the top end here, you're looking at glucotoxicity, but at the low end here, you're looking at insulin toxicity. And the reason the sulfonylurea is not as bad is that it doesn't raise the insulin so much. So, starting about mid-2012, that's when it really, really starts to get interesting because what's, what you can do is compare metformin versus a sulfonylurea. So the metformin, of course, does not raise the serum insulin levels because it's an insulin sensitizer. The sulfonylurea does, but they're both, they're both oral agents and they both, we both had the same targets in terms of hemoglobin A1C. So if you take this VA database, and you look at patients who are started either on metformin or glybride and look at the difference in cardiovascular disease or death, what you see is that the sulfonylureas do much worse. If you look at this retrospective database of 90,000 plus patients from the UK, um, you see the same thing. So a first generation sulfonylurea, second generation sulfonylurea, they both show about a 30 to 50% increase in cardiovascular events compared to metformin. And again, what you're seeing here is the effect of the treatment toxicity. So a lot of people talk about hypoglycemia and the second generations have less hypoglycemia. But there's no difference, there's no difference in the risk of myocardial infarction or mortality. It carries the same risk. It's not the risk of hypoglycemia. It's the treatment toxicity. This is another study just from last year which showed exactly the same thing. If you compare metformin to three different types of sulfonylureas, what you see is that there's a substantial difference in terms of cardiovascular events. So there's a 40 to 60% risk of, in, uh, uh, of myocardial function or death. And it's the same whether you compare them against the first or second generation sulfonylureas. Finally, we also have a randomized, um, multi-center randomized uh, placebo-controlled trial. So in this study, which was very interesting, it was metformin versus glipizide, which is another sulfonylurea. 
And what you see is that in every case, you have less deaths, less MIs, less strokes, less revascularization. When you put it all together, you have almost a 10% reduction in your risk of these bad events when you use metformin compared to the sulfonylureas. And it doesn't matter which sulfonylurea, they all are about the same. And again, you can't understand it until you realize you're looking at treatment toxicity. Um, you see the same thing in insulin infusions, actually. For a while, they, it was popular to give insulin plus glucose after an MI. And what they found was that if you look four to eight years after that trial, when you give insulin post-MI, your risk of reinfarction was almost double that if you didn't, which is actually very scary because this is only like, you know, a, a several-week infusion or protocol study. This is the Degami study. There was no benefit, but turns out it actually might be very, very harmful to infuse insulin at the time of your myocardial infarction for all those basic science reasons we talked about. You can also look at cancer because nobody ever thinks about diabetes and cancer. So diabetes is actually associated with an increased risk of cancer and it almost doesn't matter which site you look at, there's about a uh, 20 to 30 percent increase in the risk of cancer. But again, what is the mechanism here? Is it hyperinsulinemia or is it hyperglycemia? It's hard to tell. It starts to get interesting when you compare metformin versus others because at the time, of course, there was no dpp 4 so metformin was the only one which lowered the insulin levels. The rest of it we treated by raising insulin levels. And what you can see is that when you compare people using metformin to the others not using metformin, their risk of cancer was substantially lower, about 14% lower. They showed exactly the same thing in this study where they compared uh, metformin to other users and basically almost a 40% reduction in cancer. I don't actually believe it's a reduction in cancer, I believe it's an increase in cancer on the other side, particularly the sulfonylurea side and the insulin side. When you break it down again, and this is uh, Dr. Curry again who's done a lot of this work, you can see that if you compare to metformin, what is your risk of cancer? So the sulfonylureas have almost a 36% increase in your risk of cancer and the insulin of course is the worst. You have 42% increase in risk of cancer. Insulin of course is a growth factor. So you might well be worried that the insulin is going to make your cancer worse. And sure enough, it does. Um, there's a, also a very small study which showed an increase in the risk of colorectal cancer uh, if you compare insulin users to non-insulin users, but this was a much smaller study. Um, late last year, they actually identified a pathway whereby cancer and insulin sensitivity actually were mediated through the same gene. So they actually were looking at um, these uh, tumor suppressor genes, one called P10. And what was very interesting was that they knew that this had something to do with cancer, but at the same time, these people were extremely sensitive to insulin and they were also obese, and they developed cancer. In other words, it goes through the same pathway, at least in this mutation. There's a common pathway for insulin, cancer, and weight gain. That is, this mutation, the P10 mutation, leads to a very high insulin effect. So even though your insulin level is not high, the effect is all there. And what do you get? You get weight gain, decreased A1C, so a lower risk of diabetes. Your sugars are better, but increased cancer. And this is probably why the TZDs <coughs> didn't, really have, didn't really catch on, because they really work too well. Because they increase the effect of the insulin which in the case of the sugars was very good. But it wasn't so good in everything else. In fact, if you look at the people who responded the best to the TZDs, they actually had the highest increase in fat mass because they're having the highest effect of the insulin. So it decreased A1C and we thought that was good. But then later on what we found, they all gained weight, they had increased risk of MI, and they had an increased risk of cancer. So clearly there's a link between the insulin, the cancer, and the cardiovascular disease, as well as the obesity, but that is much more well known.
So if you think about our current treatment paradigm, it really is an epic fail because we only concern ourselves with the glucotoxicity, but we don't think about the insulin toxicity at all. We actually consider it irrelevant. So we give higher and higher doses to get the sugars lower and lower. So insulin for sure cures type 1 diabetes, but it causes type 2 diabetes. That is, it is making the resistance worse, and the resistance is insulin. Insulin causes type 2 diabetes, and yet that's how we treat them. So if insulin is the problem, it's probably not the solution. This is our current treatment paradigm. We keep increasing the insulin, and we keep getting more and more resistance. And you all know this from your patients. Over the years, they take 10 units, then 20 units, then 40 units, then 80 units. And you think you're doing a good job. But you're actually making them worse, not better. Because as you increase the insulin, you are getting decreased A1C, which you think is so good. But you're getting more weight gain, more heart attacks, and more cancer. So really, this is what we're doing, right? We're giving more and more insulin, and we're getting more and more resistance. So we're getting more and more diabetes. So it's, you can't treat a hyperinsulinemic state with insulin. It's really like giving alcohol to an alcoholic. So it's fine in that you can actually get rid of the delirium tremens, right? It takes care of the symptoms, but it doesn't do anything for your alcoholism. So let's look at studies, for instance, where you can lower the glucose without the hyperinsulinemia. If our hypothesis is true, we should see a beneficial effect. So if, remember I talked about the origin trial. So this was impaired glucose tolerance, so not full-blown diabetes, but impaired glucose tolerance. And you see that there's no benefit, okay? But if you compare this to using acarbose, which uh, prevents the absorption of carbohydrates, so it lowers the sugars but doesn't raise the insulin levels. What you see is that this is a randomized controlled trial in 2003. Almost 1,400 patients and followed for 3.3 years. What was their results? Well, a 49% relative risk reduction in cardiovascular disease and a very large 2.5% ab absolute risk reduction. If you think about the CURE trials, for instance, like Plavix, that's about the same magnitude of benefit, yet everybody and their mother is on Plavix and nobody's on Acarbose. Yet, the truth is that if you lower glucose with insulin, you don't see any effect. But if you lower it without raising the insulin, you do have a benefit. And that takes us, oh, the other thing uh, on this study, which is very interesting, because remember I talked about the pathway of insulin and hypertension, what you can see is that you actually get less hypertension if you treat these patients with acarbose. So compared to placebo, which had a 17% uh, probability of developing new hypertension, you only had an 11%, which was uh, highly statistically significant. And it actually makes a lot of sense because if you're giving a lot of insulin, you're going to get a lot of salt and water retention, you're going to get hypertension. So the, uh, the, 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 the other class of drug, which is relatively new, is the DPP-4s. And we don't have the trials yet, but they are coming. But it makes a lot of sense. The signals are all there. Because if you look at the uh, onset to first MACE, major adverse cardiovascular event, you can see that this was a randomized, but this is not a real trial. They kind of put all these um, patients in a mishmash and kind of lumped them all together. But you can see that if you look at them, there seems to be a very significant protective effect against cardiovascular disease with the use of saxagliptin. You can see that that effect actually exists for all the DPP-4, so citagliptin, saxagliptin, and linagliptin, and it seems that the DPP-4 is much better than the comparator, which makes sense because the DPP-4 is not going to raise your serum insulin levels on a chronic basis. So this is the same sort of data, and you can see that even though it's only one year, you start to see a lot of significant benefits. This is not a real trial. This is just kind of clumping everybody together. Um, what's very interesting is that in the case of linagliptin, they look at the comparisons. So if you compare linagliptin to placebo 
it actually didn't look any better. What, was, what, what it was, was versus the sulfonyl urea. It seemed to be that it's not so much that the linagliptin is so good for you, it's this, the sulfonyl urea is bad for you. And that's the real treatment toxicity. This is where all the toxicity lies. And these are the trials that are coming up. And we have actually a number of trials, the earliest of which I believe is coming out later this year, looking at uh, saxagliptin uh, in comparison to placebo. And later on next year, it looks like there will be a citagliptin uh, trial as well. So those should be very interesting. And all the signals point to the fact that there likely is a significant protective effect against cardiovascular disease. Uh, but we will have to wait for those. So if we think about the treatment of diabetes now, let's go over things. So insulin causes diabetes. Insulin also increases cancer and cardiovascular events. So the real key to the rational treatment of diabetes is to decrease the insulin. If you can decrease the insulin, you can reduce diabetes, cardiovascular events, and cancer. So insulin is really the problem, not the solution. This is where the problem lies. If you decrease the amount of insulin you take, your sugars are going to go high. So there definitely is an effect of the glucotoxicity. So how are you going to get around that? Well, so there's good medications to use for diabetes, so definitely metformin definitely Genuvia and Acarbose. The problem is that they may not be enough. There's bad ones too, so insulin we know is a bad agent, sulfonylureas and TZDs, because they increase the insulin effect. Those treatments actually increase your diabetes, but take care of your sugars for you. And the other thing we don't think about a lot is surgical treatments. So you can do surgical treatments for the treatment of obesity. That is, you can do a Ruan Y bypass. This is a sleeve gastrectomy where they cut, you know, most of your stomach out, and there's this banding where they put a band around your stomach so you can't eat. And what's really interesting about these is that the cure rate for diabetes in these surgical treatments is more than 90%. If you take patients and you give them a 500 kilocalorie per day diet for eight weeks, you see, see, you see actually the same thing. Their plasma, in, the glucose goes down, their hepatic glucose production goes down, and the fat kind of comes out of the liver, as well as the pancreas. But what's interesting is that they reverse the type 2 diabetes in these 10 patients, which is actually very important because it means that the changes in the insulin sensitivity and beta cell function are reversible. That's very important because the way we think about diabetes right now is that it's a chronic progressive disease. And the truth of the matter is that it's not. It's a reversible disease. We just couldn't reverse it because we were making it worse. Jason, I have yeah. Um, this study looked at extremely obese patients. Yeah. So they were morbidly obese patients that this was possible. Yeah. They didn't look at Right, but they should actually be worse. Uh, in terms of their diabetes, they should actually be worse. So if it is a chronic progressive disease, and you actually get beta cell failure, which is what they all say, the extremely obese should never get back off of their, they should never cure their diabetes, because their beta cells should have all failed by now, right? So this, both this one as well as the, um, the, this one I'll show you, which is the uh, surgical patients. They're all the worst diabetics you could ever have, right? And they all got better. That's true. This is, this is obesity, yes. This is treatment of obesity. But they, they go hand in hand. So there's a lot of diabetics as well. But the point is that it's actually not progressive. It's actually reversible. We know it's reversible because we can cure it, right? Even That's the only point. Even diabetics, diabetics for like 10, 15 years, if they lose a lot of weight, they can come off insulin. We see it all the time, right? Exactly. You send them to like Clean or Nelson Daniels and they lose 50 pounds, they come off food. Exactly. So the point is that it's not a progressive disease, which is the way we think about diabetes. So if you look at surgical treatment, so both um, Ruan Y as well as the sleeve gastrectomy, there's a 90 plus percent cure rate. So if you look at number of diabetic medications, they come really close to zero by the end. So that means it's actually reversible. But if you think about it, basically 
the surgery, they're just basically enforced fast. They're just fasting. Whether you use a low calorie diet or whether you use fasting, that's the same thing. But why do I need to do surgery for these people then? If all of the benefits is mediated through fasting, why can't I fast them? So the thing about fasting is that it's really a time-tested treatment. So this is Asterix. I loved it as a kid. But it's, about, it's a cartoon about um, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. So what they did was this guy was uh, the chief and he was fat. He had uh, fatty liver and all that. So they sent him to these hot springs where he fasted and you know, took hot baths and stuff. Just to show you that, it's actually not some crazy idea that I just came up with. They've been using fasting for like 2,000, 3,000 years. So Hippocrates was actually a major believer in fasting. So he said, our food should be our medicine, our medicine should be our food. But to eat when you are sick is to feed your sickness. So there's a lot of myths about fasting and we'll go through them uh, one by one. But a lot of people say, oh, it puts your body into starvation mode. It deprives the body of nutrients. A lot of this weight loss is from water. It causes hypoglycemia, it causes yo-yo dieting, you're overwhelmed with hunger, and what most people say to me, it's crazy. Like most people who haven't thought about it for more than two minutes, it's crazy. So the, when they did actually use fasting, this was back in the 60s, they studied this. And one of the things that was very, very interesting about fasting was that people were not overwhelmed with hunger. So in fact, the most astonishing aspect when they actually fasted these people for anywhere from 12 to 117 days, that's like more than three months of fasting, was the ease with which it was tolerated. That is, the hunger actually disappears. And in fact, it disappears after the first couple of days. The other thing people say is that, well, you're going to eat more afterwards, so it's going to be nothing, right? Well, when they studied that, it turns out it's not true. So when you fast for a day, the next day you do eat more. So in this study, they increased from 24 to 2,900 calories. So they added an extra few hundred calories on the day they were eating. But since they ate nothing on the other day, you, can, you have a total net caloric deficit of 1,958 calories. So yes, you do eat more the next day, but not nearly enough to make up for what you didn't eat on the day that you're fasting. So the world record was actually 382 days of fasting. And what was interesting, this was in 1973 when they still did this kind of stuff. They measured his blood work all the time. And there was no problem. The blood glucose comes down, but doesn't, you don't become hypoglycemic. The plasma calcium, plasma phosphorus, uric acid, all those were measured, and there was no problem. There was, no. He, was he was 456 pounds to start with. <laughs> It's not no. a total fasting. Right? I mean, how, how it was a total fast. This was published in 1973. Fluids, yeah, yeah, fluids. Yeah. Okay, that's not, total fasting, like not eating any like Oh, no, no, no. You no, can't do that. But they drink. Do they drink sugar water? Yeah. Uh, no, and then this one is just water. This is liquids, yeah. So this was the, this was the world record. This is not typical. <laughs> but what's interesting, what's interesting when you look at fasting is what actually happens to the hormone levels. So in 1974, this is the New England Journal of Medicine, they looked at it, and what they saw was that the glucose, just like the previous patient, it goes down but it remains stable. But plasma insulin significantly decreases. And you, not only do you get that, but you get a significant spike of growth hormone. Well, that's very interesting. If you look at uh, more recent studies of fasting, what you see is the same thing. Stable blood sugars, but the insulin level just drops like a stone. If you look at the uh, free fatty acids, it actually significantly increases because you're actually feeding your body through your own fat. That's great. If you look at the weight, it comes down, but if you look at the resting metabolic rate, it actually maintains itself very well, even after 22 days of alternate day fasting. So this is, of course, the major problem with most diets, and this has been shown over and over again. As you diet, your metabolic rate drops, and that makes your caloric intake 
equal again and you're not going to lose weight. So you plateau. So if you think about those diabetics who decrease their uh, calories from 2000 to 1700, they gain 20 pounds. Why? Because their resting metabolic rate goes down. But it doesn't happen in the case of fasting. If you look at fat oxidation, it significantly increases. So the fat is being burned off and the carbohydrate in, uh, goes down because you're not taking carbohydrates. You don't have any stored carbohydrates save a little bit of glycogen. It's all fat stores and that's what's happening. That's excellent. If you look at insulin sensitivity, you can show a significant improvement. So if you put them on a euglycemic clamp again and then infuse insulin, you can tell how well the body is using uh, the glucose, how well it goes into the cell. And that's a measure of the insulin resistance. So what you do is you put peop healthy people on intermittent fasting and you see that there's a significant <coughs> difference in their insulin sensitivity. The other interesting thing is that the norepinephrine levels significantly increase. So this is resting energy expenditure again. You can see that it is maintained over four days of fasting. So people think, oh, you're going to be tired. You're not. Your basal, basal metabolic rate and your resting energy expenditure is the same. But look at norepinephrine. Your norepinephrine levels, your adrenaline levels, go through the roof. You have more energy while you're fasting, not less. So here's your insulin levels. Your insulin levels go down, which is what we expect. Your glucose levels go down, which is what we expect. And your fatty acid levels go up. That's exactly what we want. Now think about ICU care for, for a minute. This is what happens when you fast. Think about when you go into septic shock or if you get a pneumonia or a cold. The first thing your body does is put you into severe anorexia. You don't eat. Why? Your basal metabolic rate stays the same. Your epinephrine, your adrenaline levels go up and your glucose goes down, which is what you want. You want to put the glucose in lockdown because if you've got bacteria circulating all over your body, the last thing you want to do is have a lot of sugar running around all over the place. That's exactly what you want. So you lock down the glucose. It's like a prison break, right? Everything goes into lockdown. So you lock down the glucose. You lock down the iron because that's what the bacteria want. You pump up the norepinephrine because you want to support your blood pressure. And then you wonder in the ICU why when you shove a nasogastric tube the first day and start feeding them, you don't have any benefit. The body is already telling you, don't eat. Severe anorexia, they're not going to want to eat. The last ICU talk that we had exactly was that you have to give them nutrition. I know, they all say that, they all say that. I don't think they're correct. <laughs> This is. So, the cortisol, was the they the cortisol. Uh, they did it in that. Yeah. You are? Um, but sometimes you notice that in like diabetics, when they are sick, their sugars go higher. Yeah, that's a different. That's through the stress hormones and so on. That's a little bit different. But if you look at the nice sugar study from the, this was the New England Journal in 2009. This was tight glucose control in the ICU. What happens when you give people insulin to control their sugars? And contrary to what was expected, you didn't show a benefit to tight glucose control with insulin. You actually showed increased mortality in the ICU. So the other interesting thing hormonally wise is that you get a spike in your growth hormone. So you can see that as you fast, your growth hormone actually spikes up. And the growth hormone we know increases the availability and utilization of the fat and also preserves your muscle mass, which is very important. The, if you look, and, and this is, I think, the best study because what they did was they took caloric energy restriction, but they did it two ways. So these are equal calories. One is a continual, every day lower your calories a little bit. The other one was a fasting protocol. But the calories are the same between the two arms. And what you see is that the weight, there's no difference, but you can see that the intermittent IER, which is intermittent energy um, restriction, actually loses a bit more weight, their body fat goes down a bit more, their waist size goes down quite a bit more, but look at the insulin sensitivity. If you take the same amount of calories every day, your body just gets used to it. So your insulin sensitivity doesn't change. But as you do intermittent energy restriction, your insulin sensitivity significantly increases. 
And this gets back to the nitro patch. Because the way that you have to increase your sensitivity is to have periods of extremely low levels. So that's what you're doing. You're just taking off the nitro patch. As you have a fasting day, your insulin levels are going to go down. And that low levels of insulin are going to increase your sensitivity. Yeah. So instead of total fast, can you just not eat carbohydrate? You can't because protein actually raises your insulin levels. That's not very well known, but if you look at studies of whey protein or other types of protein, um, your insulin levels, your glucose does not go up, but your insulin does. So beef, for instance, actually is fairly insulinogenic, and so is whey, which is dairy protein. So you can't. It's not going to work. You could eat all fat for the day, but that's what you're doing, actually, when you're fasting. Butter. Yeah, the all-butter diet. Um, you can actually do that, but you're doing that when you fast because all you're doing is you're burning fat. You're not burning protein because your lean mass stays the same, but you're basically oxidizing your fat. And this is the insulin levels as well as the HOMA, which is a measure of insulin sensitivity. So this is intermittent energy restriction, and this is continuous energy restriction. So you can see there's a significant difference and a much better outcome when you use intermittent energy restriction. And this is independent of the calorie restriction. So both arms have the same amount of calories. So if you think about the clinical effects, you might say, well, is there any clinical benefits to fasting? And the evidence is still accumulating. One of the things that's very interesting about the Mediterranean diet is that people actually thought the initial studies were done in Crete where they say, oh, the, the Cretans had very, very low cardiovascular disease and they said, well, it's because of the Mediterranean diet. But they, what they forgot is that the Greek Orthodox Church fasts like all the time, right? Some people say between 180 and 200 fasting days a year. I know, I know, but nevertheless, it's still, it's still an essential. No, I've asked uh, a few people who are Greek it's Orthodox. It's, said, it's, it's, it's actually a. That's how a budget cut Show me how you're going to convince people to do this. I'll get to that in a second. So you can see that actually that fasting reduces your diabetes. So if you take obese type 2 diabetics, and you put them on a standard calorie restriction, they do okay, as in their weight does come down on a standard uh, caloric diet. But you can see both fasting protocols, whether it's one day a week or episodic five days, they come down much better. What's again interesting is if you look at the percentage of subjects with a hemoglobin A1C less than 6%, you can see compared to the standard diet, the fasting patients did much, much better. So they had much better glucose control. The other thing that's important is, is that the five days better than the one day? The five day. They do episodic five days. So five days of fasting, then a break. Then, then a five. break. Yeah, and it's episodic. Uh, you'd have to go and back to the... <laughs> Fasting's not nearly as difficult as you think yeah. it is. <laughs> the other thing that you see in fasting, which is always, which is actually um, compared to standard diets, what happens and people always forget this, is that weight comes down, but in most diets, you lose both fat mass as well as lean mass. And that's in almost every single diet study you see this. But when you look at the fasting study, the fat mass comes down, so day one is 43 down to 38, but you look at your fat-free mass, it goes from 52 to 51.9. In other words, there's no difference, there's no muscle loss in a fasting diet. And that makes sense because if you think back to the caveman days and you couldn't hunt anything, you couldn't get anything for three days, if you were weak as a kitten, you'd never eat again because you couldn't get out there and hunt. So what the body does is it preserves the lean mass with the growth hormone, pumps up the adrenaline, and gives you enough energy to get out there. The waist circumference, of course, comes down much more. But it's all fat. It's all fat mass that's being burned. If you look at cardiovascular risk factors, you can see that the total cholesterol on this alternate daily fasting is down about 20-something percent. The LDL cholesterol comes down. The HDL does come down somewhat, but you can see it's much less than the others. And the triglycerides significantly decreases, almost about 30 percent. 
in these fasting protocols. Um, another doctor, Dr. Horn, recently has published a couple of studies. These are association studies, but he looked at Mormons because they typically fast one day per month. And he took these Mormons and he compared them to the ones who fasted and the ones who didn't fast. And he tried to see who did better. Well, he actually didn't do it for fasting, but he looked at all different, you know, religious observance, social supports, and he couldn't find any relationship except for fasting. The only thing that came out was the fasting. Fasting seemed to have a significantly protective effect. So then he went on to do a prospective study of patients undergoing angiography, and he looked at the people who fasted and the people who didn't fast. And again, what he showed was that for a similar age and a similar BMI, they had far less diabetes and slightly less coronary artery disease. Now this one is, they're all going for angiography, so you might expect that there's a very high prevalence. But there seems to be an association this is not randomized, but there seems to be an association between less diabetes and less coronary disease. So let's think about treatment of diabetes again. So we know that insulin causes diabetes. Jim? So just uh, thinking about the different populations we have, so a lot of this to me seems to fit with the usual North American overweight population. What about what we see a lot of them in Scarborough especially is the relatively thin, with a tiny, tiny South Asian population. Yeah, with the South Asians, I, there's really, you know, the data is just not there. I couldn't really comment either way. It could be true, it could not be true. I couldn't really tell you uh, for that population. Um, so if you think about type 2 diabetes and how we treat it, so what we've gone over is that insulin causes diabetes. It increases your cardiovascular events and cancer. And the other thing is that it's a curable disease, but we have to lower the insulin levels. So what we need to do is basically bariatric surgery without the surgery. And that would be a fasting protocol because all these beneficial effects of fasting are going to help our diabetic patients. So this is the real question we have now. <laughs> okay, now you're going too far. <laughs> can you actually, can we actually cure type 2 diabetes? Because we know it's a curable disease. Well, think about it for a second. That's incredible. Because if there's no diabetes, there's no more diabetic nephropathy. No more diabetic retinopathy. <laughs> no more neuropathy. <laughs> so, <laughs> the whole problem with diabetic nephropathy, and we treat this all the time, is that we don't do anything for these patients. You're just marking time until dialysis. Because you can't cure the diabetic nephropathy without curing the diabetes. It's the same with the nephropathy, the retinopathy. You're just marking time. And the treatment would be no drugs, no surgery. In fact, you'd be reducing your drugs. There's no cost to the patient. In fact, you'd be saving them money. And there's no long-term side effects. The treatment has been used for 5,000 years. And in fact, we know what happens when you fast somebody by stapling their stomach for six months or eight months or ten months at a time. Nothing. They get better. The Swedish obesity study, which is on bariatric surgery, they're living longer without diabetes. But why do I have to do the surgery? In fact, I think that we could use a six to twelve month course of intensive fasting to cure diabetes. And in fact, I've already done it. So this is my patient I just saw yesterday. So he's 45 years old. He's had diabetes for 20 years. He was on 100 units of insulin a day. And I said to him about two months ago, this is crazy. I think we're killing you. And he said, you know, you're, you're right. So I said, OK, come to my clinic. I'm going to put you on a fasting regimen. So I saw him yesterday. He's off all his insulin. His sugars are like five to seven. I said, you're basically cured of your diabetes. But tell us more, like, be a little more, I just want to know what you told it to do. Okay, I'll get to that in a second. Let me just finish up and then I'll get to that in a second. See, we don't do it, but we can get to it. 
<laughs> this is actually not my only patient. I actually have three patients now, two which were much less severe, who are only on metformin. I put them on two months. They're very much less severe. No medications. Their A1C was 6.3%. In other words, they are cured of their type 2 diabetes. The other one had diabetes for 25 years. He told, I was seeing them because they had nephropathy. Now they're cured. So what do we do now? It's time to get started. I think we need to change the way we think about diabetes and change the treatment. That's the only way we're going to treat it. What we've been doing is just making it worse. And because we've been making it worse, we say it's a chronic disease. That's the wrong idea. We've misunderstood diabetes, and we have to change that. I think that's the end.